Do you ever find yourself wondering what would happen if the lights went out? That was convenient. Like I was saying, do you wonder what would happen if the lights went out for a long time? If grid power was unavailable for a week? Two weeks? A month or more? Would a couple Tesla Powerwalls be enough to weather an extended outage? That is exactly what I set out to learn. Today is Saturday, February 8th, and it's about 10, 10 in the morning, and I am going to shut off our connection to the grid. So let's just head out here and get this all taken care of. There we go, grid connection cut. All right, so I just cut power. Do you see the lights are still on in here? And yeah, there we go. You see here that the uh, power walls have entered backup mode, so they are powering the house and it's splitting between uh, solar and the batteries while solar also recharges the batteries at the same time and all that jazz that I covered in my power wall video. Um, the batteries are currently at 63%, so I'm not starting this at 100% or anything like that. I just what they happen to be at, I figured that'd be a more realistic test of losing grid power. So, we'll see how long this lasts. Now that we're on battery power and we'll be on battery power for an indeterminate amount of time, I am going to make some adjustments to the Open EVSE that we use for charging the Model S overnight. So I've gone ahead and logged into the Open EVSE control panel here, and what I'm going to do is uh, first I'm going to set an energy limit because I don't. I don't want it to completely drain the battery at night. I don't want to risk that. I know usually we don't need more than about nine to 12 kilowatt hours per night to recharge the S because it doesn't get driven that far each day. Um, but just until I have a feel for how much um, energy we have to work with at night, I'm going to set an energy limit to, um, I'm going to set the energy limit to 10 kilowatt hours. So it will stop charging after it has delivered 10 kilowatt hours to the car. So, all right, that's all set up. Uh, and that, that was done right. I think I have to cover my face here. That was done right there. And now I'm gonna scroll down here and I'm also gonna change the max current. That EVSE is on a 1450 outlet, so it can deliver a maximum of 40 amps. However, the continuous, uh, the continuous output of the power walls is only about 10 kilowatts. So. Um, we can't do that. There won't be any, if we're charging at 40 amps, there won't be any headroom left to run the stuff in the house at night. Now, during the day when solar is shining and stuff, we do have more energy to play with. Um, but, you know, that's, that's something to experiment with later. So I'm going to set this to, I'm going to set the current limit to 30 amps. I went and changed it right there. And what that does is it reconfigures the pilot signal and tells the car, hey, you can't pull more than 30 amps from this charging station. So that's all set. It should give plenty of headroom for running everything in the house. You know, if the heaters are running or, or what have you, we shouldn't have any problems there. It's day three of the very safe zombie apocalypse because there aren't actually any zombies and everything is fine for a narrow definition of fine or whatever it is I called it on Twitter. I really need a better name. Anyway, I'm starting to think that this was uh, perhaps a terrible time or a great time to do this experiment because yesterday, day two, we had a winter storm warning and it was overcast with little patches of sun here and there for pretty much the entire day. Uh, so rather than our usual production that we'd expect in early February, that would be like north of 40 kilowatt hours, we produced less than 30. So that combined with charging up the Model S for my wife to use to go to work and stuff, uh, meant that the batteries topped out at 82% yesterday. Not a huge deal because we didn't have any charging to do overnight, but not great. So we woke up this morning at uh, 50%. Also, not great, but you know, workable. And it was overcast again. However, however, um, the clouds have mostly blown away, which is good because it managed to get the batteries up to 92% by, oh, maybe two o'clock or so, which is a little later than usual but it, it worked out. And right now, because we have some extra solar production, uh, I'm using that to put a little extra juice into the Model 3. You can see I've put about mm, 3.3 kilowatt hours into it. 
It's charging at 32 amps, which I know is a higher charge rate than what I had talked about using previously, but again, sun is shining, we have a little extra power headroom. I did, however, learn something unfortunate about the Open EVSE, and that being that the energy limit setting doesn't stay across sessions. So as soon as a charging session ends, it clears that setting and then you have to reset it every time, which is less than ideal. And I got in touch with the people at Open EVSC about this and was told that that is something they are considering for the Open EVSC Wi-Fi V3. So I don't, I don't know if that's even possible on this version of the hardware. Uh, however, uh, there is a way to set custom values. So if you don't want to set it to be just like a 10 or a 15 kilowatt hour limit, um, you can use the RAPI commands to define a custom limit, which you, let, me, let me show you how to do that real quick. First, log into the web interface of your open EVSC charging station. For the sake of simplicity, I'm only going to cover using RAPI commands through the open EVSC web interface. You'll need to navigate to the system tab, scroll down and enable developer mode, which will cause the RAPI tab to appear. Then click the RAPI tab. Once there, you'll see lists of get commands, set commands, and system functions. If you want to check what the session energy limit is set for, simply enter $GH into the RAPI command box and press send. If it returns zero, then there's no energy limit set. To set a custom energy limit, enter $SH followed by a space and the desired energy limit in kilowatt hours as an integer and press send. For example, $SH space 12 would set the session energy limit to 12 kilowatt hours. And that's it, you're done. I'm thinking that maybe I should set up one of our spare like low power computers to spam that command to the open EVSE after a certain time just to make sure I don't forget. Um, but yeah, don't, don't know yet. Either way, going pretty well so far. Day 33, and what a wet day it has been. In fact, this whole week has been dark and rainy, but we've been managing. We haven't had any issues keeping the Model S charged up enough to get my wife to work and back. Uh, haven't had any issues with the house losing power, though it, it has felt like we've gotten kind of close. I think the farthest we've gotten is um, down to 12% state of charge. And that's largely because with all the clouds and stuff, we haven't been able to bring the state of charge in the power walls up to its usual like 98% by the end of the day. Right now we're sitting at about 40% and we're, we're not gonna get any more today. Uh, but that is enough to get us through till tomorrow morning, uh, provided we don't charge the Model S tonight, which is okay because I think it's at about 60, 70%, so that, that should be fine. Um, and then we'll have some light tomorrow and you know that'll bring the state of charge back up. And So everything's been going okay, despite the bad weather. That said, it's been 33 days. I think I found my answer and made my point which is that, yes, with two power walls, you absolutely can run off-grid in an emergency situation. And I, I frame that as an emergency situation because even though this is working and we haven't changed anything about our habits uh, really to, to adjust to it or anything, um, it doesn't seem like something you'd really want to juggle long-term. I mean, I've essentially invented range anxiety for a house, and that's not great. House range anxiety aside, there haven't been a lot of these updates, mostly because not much has happened. We've just been going about our lives normally and everything's been fine. And uh, yes, a large part of that is because we have 8.9 kilowatts of solar on the roof and live in what is generally a very sunny place. But even when it isn't sunny, having that much uh, potential production on the roof means that you know even, even in a day when it's overcast and we have clouds, we're still producing anywhere between like one and two and a half kilowatts. And that's enough to get us by. Some of our clocks, however, have been getting a bit silly. This clock right here, for example, uh, isn't actually running slow, it's running very fast. I haven't changed it since our switch over to daylight savings time. It is catching up to the correct time, it is so fast. And the reason it's running so fast is because anytime the power walls enter their higher frequency state to suppress the solar inverters, which happens basically every afternoon that we have sun, it slightly increases the AC frequency. And these clocks are using the AC frequency as a reference clock. So as the AC frequency increases, well, the clock just runs faster. And over the course of the last 33 days, these clocks have become 34 minutes fast. So yeah, something to keep in mind when you're, when you're 
going off grid with the power walls. At this point though, I think it's time to just reconnect the house to the grid. I, I don't think there's really more for me to learn here. Here we go. Well, there's the click. All right, we're at standby. We're back on grid for the first time in a month. Backup history. <laughs> there we go. February 8th, 798 hours, 15 minutes. And speaking of things learned, uh, I think I will hand it off to future me to talk about that. So what have I learned over the past 33 days spent disconnected from grid power? First off, that extended off-grid operation with only two power walls absolutely is doable. It would be a little easier with three power walls, but that's a lot of additional expense in exchange for a bit more convenience in an unlikely scenario. My wife and I approached this experiment from the standpoint of not meaningfully changing our daily routine, which limited how effectively we could optimize our energy usage, and introduced the diciest part of the whole experiment, charging them on less at night. On a typical February day, despite somewhat short winter days and suboptimal sun angle, our 8.9 kilowatt solar array can produce between 40 and 45 kilowatt hours. This means that once house usage is taken into account, and depending on the day, we could dedicate up to about 32 kilowatt hours to electric car charging. However, because two power walls can only hold about 27 kilowatt hours and solar panels don't produce energy at night, no more than 12 kilowatt hours of EV charging could occur at night if we wanted to keep the power wall state of charge at or above 10% by sunrise. Thankfully, my wife's commute is short and only uses between 8 and 13 kilowatt hours per day, but in an actual grid outage situation, it would make a lot more sense to rotate cars and only charge the cars during the day, allowing us to capture energy in excess of what the power walls can store and provide more flexibility when cloudy weather is encountered. After all, pulling the power walls down to 10% by charging the Model S at night and then encountering dense clouds all day is no fun you end up frantically reducing energy usage and compulsively checking the Tesla app, hoping that you hit the minimum power wall state of charge necessary for the house to make it through the night. It's like range anxiety, but for your house. I did encounter a couple notable Tesla home energy gateway glitches during our time spent off-grid, the first of which was minor and involved the Tesla app occasionally toggling out of its backup mode display. The second glitch, however, occurred on day 21 when the Tesla gateway completely dropped off the network. It wasn't feeding data to the Tesla app, I couldn't access the gateway via the web interface, the gateway's hardwire and wireless network interfaces didn't show up on my home network, and I had no way to check on the power wall state of charge. The system was still powering the house though. The gateway came back online on its own at around 4 a.m. on day 22, but the data logged in the Tesla app from around 2 p.m. on day 21 until about 4 a.m. on day 22 was junk. I'm still not sure why the gateway did this. Anyway, that's about it for this video. Is complete off-grid functionality something that you see value in and think products like the Powerwall are appropriate for? Do you have any questions about Powerwalls and off-grid operation? Let me know in the comments below, and as always, I'll see you later.